Hi, welcome. Hello, my name is Kristen Nance, I'm a member of the Dole Student Advisory Board. We would like to welcome you to the Dole Institute of Politics and thank you for attending this afternoon's presentation. The Dole Student Advisory Board is composed of students committed to the work of the Dole Institute. We have regular meetings, assist in events like this one, and plan an SAB program every semester. Members of the SAB receive great opportunities to work, network, and meet our special guests. If you're a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. At the end of this afternoon's program, please let us know by contacting us on Twitter, Facebook, or through our website email. If you prefer to write us a note, a notepad will be available at the front table where you can leave us a little note. Before we begin, I would like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones, and after the interview, we will have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand. A student will bring you a microphone. Please keep your question brief and only one question. And now I'd like to introduce to you the director of the Dole Institute, Bill Lacey. Thank you very much, Kristen. Thank you all of you for coming out today. This is uh, quite a wonderful crowd on a beautiful day, and we very much appreciate your taking the time to come out and listen to this very important presentation this afternoon. Uh, appreciate your support and your interest at the Dole Institute. Um, the person who's gonna introduce our guest today is a very uh, good friend of mine, a very good friend of Bob Dole and the Dole Institute of Politics. Uh, Dave Owen goes all the way back to the 19, before the 1974, 1968. 1968 Dole Senate race. That's a little bit before my time with Senator Dole, Dave. So, uh, but he goes all the way back to the 68 race, was involved in uh, all of the senator's campaigns, um, is somebody who has been very uh, helpful to the Dole Institute. He recruited our guest today, so it was only fair that I would ask Dave to come over and introduce him to you. Please welcome Dole Institute of Politics friend, Dave Owen. Thank you very much, uh, Bill, and, and thank you so much. This is a wonderful crowd today. It's, it's really my pleasure to introduce a true American hero. Um, Dick, uh, Dick Holm uh, has served with distinction in the CIA over many decades. Uh, I believe he served under 13 CIA directors. He's a recipient of the uh, Distinguished Intelligence Award, which is the highest award offered by the CIA. Uh, he uh, started with the CIA in the 1960s, and his first posting was to Laos during the CIA secret war there leading up to the Vietnam conflict. Uh, he then was posted to the Congo, and while there, he was involved in a plane crash that nearly cost him his life. Fortunately, he was rescued by some native tribesmen who treated him with some black substance made of snake oil and tree bark, I think, and he survived. And uh, he was returned to U.S. Uh, custody and back to the United States for very long and painful recovery. But he went on to a very distinguished career with some very, very interesting assignments, uh, not the least of which uh, was uh, his involvement in the anti-terrorist activity against Carlos the Jackal when he was posted in, in uh, Paris. Uh, Dick Holm uh, is a very interesting guy and his book, uh, The Craft We Chose, is filled with incidents and anecdotes that rival anything you're gonna see on TV or in the movies, but they're true. So let me welcome uh, Dick Holm. Thank you very much for a lot of kind words. I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I have a, a few connections with Kansas via my parents and my brother, but uh, I don't get here all that often. I have to tell you that I, I thought of this moment about two months ago after we had agreed that I would come here, and I'll tell you why. Um, I turned on the TV one afternoon and there was a basketball game. Kansas was playing Missouri. Kansas was down by 19 points, so I turned it on in the second half. And as you all know, Kansas ultimately won that game. Um, so impressed was I that I, uh, in our little family basketball pool during March Madness, I picked Kansas to win. And, uh, um, and in the interest of full disclosure, I'll, I'll also tell you that 
I am from Illinois and I'm a Big Ten guy. So, so picking Kansas was way out of my uh, league. And it, but it, it, it worked. I mean, they, uh, they came very close. Uh, I did lose my $10, but it was worth it. I don't know. Um, it is true that I wrote a book. Um, it's a memoir, memoir about uh, a career, 35 years in the uh, clandestine service, the CIA uh, clandestine service. It, um, it's about an, a career in intelligence, intelligence which involved going overseas to collect um, reporting for our policymakers. So uh, I thought it would be useful to go over for a few minutes um, what we were doing and why. That is to say, what is the CIA <coughs> all about? Um, there is, I think, a general consensus that the country needs intelligence. The, uh, the policymakers have to know as much as they can about a given situation before they can make their decisions. And that, of course, that's the role of the intelligence community, which is 17 different organizations. Don't ask me to list them, but I, I'm, I know generally where they all are. But, uh, and in particular, the, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency. That's, that's what we do, is to try to collect that information. There are people who are happy and people who are unhappy about the fact that we are the, the world's only superpower. And a superpower cannot function, so to speak, blind or deaf. Um, it, you, you've got to have a flow of information coming to the policymakers about an incredible range of different subjects um, in order to let them make their decisions. Um, and that's, that's really, that was, that's our effort. Um, in, a, in a city, Washington, D.C., where there is consensus nowadays on almost nothing, <laughs> there is just not much agreement, but in that city, there is a consensus on the fact that intelligence is our first line of defense. Um, as good as our military is, and our military is, is, is damn good, um, they have to know where to go and who to get. And that they get from the intelligence community in general and from the clandestine service in particular. Um, so as the first line of defense, we assume a pretty heavy responsibility for, um, for the nation's national security. Um, just in brief, the CIA itself, uh, organized in 1947 by uh, President Truman, and it was essentially uh, a reaction to Pearl Harbor. Uh, we didn't want to be caught uh, looking again. Um, there have been successes and there have been failures, as all of you may know, uh, who followed uh, this history. But um, when it was established, it was, there were four, and it's still the same, they have four different directorates. One is uh, administration. No secret, it's logistics and finance and personnel and data, database, that sort of thing. One is um, science and technology. Again, no big secret. Um, they do scientific and technological stuff. Um, they're the ones who developed uh, the U-2. They're the ones that developed our, the satellite programs early on. Um, they're the ones who, who developed a host of items and machines and little gadgets that, that we use, the clandestine service used in the course of our human collection efforts abroad. Um, special cameras, special transmitters, special concealment devices, that sort of thing, all comes out of the science and, science and technology directorate. A third one is uh, directorate of intelligence, and that houses the analysts of our effort. The analysts, um, as you would guess, are, are largely academically oriented. They do research. They read thoroughly. They, they, they collect all the raw intelligence that there is on a given subject. And then they write what's called a finished intelligence. Part of what they use is the product of my efforts, raw intelligence. When we're overseas and we're collecting intelligence from the various networks that we run, uh, that is called raw intelligence. It goes back, and the analysts use that as they use 
satellite photography, um, NSA intercept reporting, a whole host, a whole range of, of our collection. And then those finished reports go to the policymakers, uh, and that's that, that's it. It it starts um, in the Washington level with questions that come from any branch of the executive uh, branch, any department or agency. Um, it could be Department of State, Department of Defense, Department of Commerce, Department of Energy. They send questions to the intelligence community. We're working on an issue right now that's of importance to the nation and we want to know such and such and such. It could be the, the rice crop in China or um, India or someplace in the world and, and they're working on down the road what's the pricing going to be, what are the export issues going to be, what's the world transportation commerce going to be, and they need that information to make their decisions. We provide it. Um, when all those questions get collected, they become what we, what we refer to as requirements. And requirements are processed by a staff in the intelligence community, actually at the CIA, um, and they decide where best to send those questions which agency or which directorate of, the, of our agency is, is best suited to collect that information. Um, the clandestine service focuses on human intelligence. Um, so if it's human intelligence and it's uh, questions about what we, we call Burma, um, that would go to our Far East division in the directorate of, of uh, in the clandestine service. Huh? I, I will mix these up, so let me just make it. For 35 years, it was a directorate of operations. That's where I worked. In its wisdom, after 9-11, Congress decided to call it and said the National Clandestine Service. It's a semantics trap, and it traps me a lot. So if I say director of operations, or I say national, it's the same thing. Same thing. Um, those, those collection efforts then are mounted by our people, and, and they... Um, they're the, the, the origin of the efforts to collect that intelligence. When I say human intelligence, uh, let me clarify there a little. You can, from a satellite or from a, a U-2 plane, get overhead coverage of a platoon of tanks in a field, say. Um, and you have that. That's what you have. We saw a platoon of tanks in the field. And that can be useful, and it depends on the situation, um, how useful or little. If, if we have recruited as an agent the commander of that platoon of tanks, human intelligence, that means we know how many there are, where they're going, what their effort is going to be. They intend to attack such and such a military base. They intend to overrun a such and such a city. So the value of human intelligence is often far greater than, than the other kinds of intelligence. Um, I say that modestly, uh, but it's true, and some of the others might dispute that, but in fact, uh, we, get, we get good intelligence from it. Now, the clandestine service, after all those four directorates, you focus on the clandestine service. One of, one of the easiest ways to... to to describe our effort is we are after plans and intentions um, writ large, which is to say we, we're after, we want to get to the highest levels we can in any given country or every, any given organization, and we want to know what, what they're planning to do, and, and obviously with, a, with an eye toward how is it going to affect our national interest, United States national interest. So plans and intentions um, is the, the large uh, umbrella for our efforts. Under that, we have collection activities. Obviously, that's the, that's the key one. Uh, we have counterintelligence activities, and we have covert action. Uh, act During my career, for example, when I was posted in Hong Kong, um, our goal was collection. At that time, there was a bamboo curtain. Uh, we could not go into Hong Kong at all, so it was what we termed a denied area. For a long time, the Soviet Union was a denied area. In today's world, North Korea 
is a denied area. So it increases the challenge for us to try to mount the kinds of operations needed to get into those areas, recruit agents, debrief people, and get the intelligence out for our policymakers. Um, denied area operations are tougher. Um, on the one hand, they're very rewarding. On the other hand, um, if, you, if you send a report back to Washington that you're pretty sure is going to go to the president's desk tomorrow morning, you feel pretty good about that. That's, you, you've, you've accomplished something uh, pretty worthwhile. Um, counterintelligence operations, uh, two kinds. One, we mount every effort we can to protect our own operations in a given situation, a given country, a given area. We, we cannot afford to have our operations uh, exposed to other intelligence services or other security services in, in the countries where we're working. Bear in mind that when we're overseas, we're working, we're doing our job, um, it is illegal in that country, uh, which is why it has to be um, carefully monitored and it has to be clandestine. Another kind of counterintelligence operations is when we mount efforts to penetrate other hostile intelligence services. There was the KGB and the GRU, now they're called like the FR. Um, we would mount operations to try to find out what they're up to and, thereby, and thwart their efforts. In that kind of a counterintelligence operation, we work very closely with the FBI. Uh, that is, that we, we forward to the FBI any information we have ab about a hostile operation directed against the United States. So counterintelligence is a very important area as well. Um, over the years, we've been, I think, very fortunate, and I think it comes back to the kinds of people uh, we, we hire and we work with, and I'll get into that a little later, but um, we've been fortunate to have very few breaches of our own security. Um, Aldrich Ames, of course, is, a, is an example of, a, of an effort that, that shocked us to our bones. We, we could hardly believe that one of our officers would volunteer and then report to uh, the Russian services. It was, uh, it was a very, very hard, hard bit of news for us to receive in, uh, in 1994. Throughout um, our activities, throughout our training, throughout our activities uh, at headquarters, everywhere, on a regular basis, it is told and retold that we are not policymakers. Intelligence officers are not policymakers. We are providing the information to the policymakers, but we are objective as possible in terms of the various kinds of policies that would come up. Um, I, I would, again, candidly think that in some cases we should have been the policymakers because we're smarter, but that, <laughs> they, that did not prevail as a point of view in, in Washington. Um, we, We'd pass it on, and, and that was the, the essence of the whole thing. So I'm, I've tried to cover sort of briefly, and I'm, I'm happy later to take some questions, but uh, briefly, what, what is the intelligence community? What is the CIA? What is the clandestine service? And I was one of the guys in the clandestine service who went overseas and did the collecting. Um, at, as I grew uh, higher ranked, I became a chief of the stations in, in various cities. Um, where we would monitor, and at those cases, I would actually uh, deal with the foreign governments. Um, very, very exciting, very rewarding. Um, I would say that apart from one airplane crash, um, I couldn't have had a better career. I was pleased by it all. So let's, let's talk about the book a little bit and some of the experiences that I had um, in the course of this career. Um, as was mentioned on my first tour, after a, a year's worth of training, I, I trained in, uh, first of all, in clandestine services activities, tradecraft, from whence cometh the name of the book. Um, tradecraft is the art, and I say art uh, because it is, it's a people-oriented, and some people are good at it, some people are not good at it. Um, but it's that art of, of developing relationships, um, um, eliciting information, running clandestine operations, paying attention to detail, um, all the things that are involved in that thing. 
And I, I have been there and done that, as they say. Um, so I can, I can certainly address questions on that subject. Um, after the clandestine, the tradecraft training, I, I then, and at that time, I'll point out, this is a long time ago, um, my, uh, there was a draft here in the States, and so all of us, virtually all of us, had military training. Um, that was just a, a fact of life. And my military training had, had been in, uh, in the south of France, in Bordeaux. Somebody had to go, as they say. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I grew to know a lot about wine and other things while I was over there. But that was a military tour, and I spoke some French. Um, but for the second part of my training, I took paramilitary uh, operations. Um, and that was uh, designed to make uh, our officers a, a, a group of them. We had to volunteer for that. Um, we jumped out of airplanes. We went to the jungle warfare school. We did weapons training. In organ, order for us to be able to deal with uh, leaders of a lot of foreign countries who are military, um, thinking that you know, if, if you can converse and, and function and do those things, you're better suited to try to develop relationships with military officers in various countries in Latin America, Africa, Asia, uh, that were headed by, by uh, military officers. So we did that training, and when we finished, uh, I and, and three of my colleagues volunteered to go to Laos. So um, we, we flew over to Laos. Within a week, I, I went from visiting my parents in Prairie Village, Kansas, to um, standing on a mountaintop in the north of Laos watching a little plane fly away, uh, leaving me with my Hmong uh, brothers. My, the, the, we worked with the Hmong tribe in, in North Laos. Um, very, very stalwart bunch of guys. I mean, we, we, just, we were very, very pleased to have to work with them. And they, were, they just wanted to keep their own independence and fight, and, and we were perfectly happy to try to help them. So. So I, I lived in a, in a Hmong village, three or four of them, over a, a several month period. And I mean a village. Um, no running water, no electricity, no refrigerators, no beer, no, I mean, no nothing. Um, and we ate, uh, I ate what they ate, uh, uh, roast pork and roast chicken and vegetables. Um, but I mean, I was happy as could be. I mean, I felt like I was right in the mix, that's where the action was. And we were organizing them to try to thwart North Vietnamese operations into Laos. Uh, guerrilla warfare, ambushes, blowing up bridges. Uh, I mean, it wasn't your conventional tradecraft at all, but I knew that at the time that I, I, I was gonna have a, a sort of a segue into that career. Um, on one given day, um, I, I walked, I took a platoon of Hmong, not a platoon, maybe 10 or 12, and we walked to the next village. It took about six hours, uh, seven hours, so we couldn't come back the same day. Uh, we spent the night. Uh, on the way back, it was uphill, so it took about eight hours. Uh, you had to walk everywhere you went unless you got an Air America, a little airplane to fly you. But anyway, we got back, and that day, it was, it was drizzling all day long. And of course it was warm, you were sweaty and drizzly and wet. And got back to our village, so to speak, and I was feeling a chill. And I thought, well, you know, I, obviously I'm all wet and whatnot. So I changed and dried off, um, still feeling a chill. Um, didn't eat, didn't feel like eating, got a fever. Uh, spent the night lying in my little hut on a bamboo cot with a parachute for, for a, a, a blanket and uh, had a terrible night. I mean, I felt lousy. Um, next morning, uh, I still felt lousy. I did not get up. I did not go out you know, to be seen and to have some sticky rice and, and fish. So I, that was nothing. And of course, the word got out in the village. He is sick. He is sick. You know, there weren't very, many Americans in that area. So when you're there, you were, everybody took note. Noon comes. And in comes the leader of my Thai team that was with me. I had four Thai special forces guys with me up there. He comes in and he said, well, the Naiban, the Naiban is the head of the village. The Naiban says he's going to send the shaman in to help you. I said, the shaman, you know. I said, don't be silly. I don't, you know. 
He said, sir, you can't do that. The Naiban is the head of the village. It would be a big, in fact, in this particular guy, he was the head of three or four villages. It would be a big insult to him if you refuse. You're an honored guest and he's trying to help you. I, I, finally, I said, okay, okay. I'm not drinking any potion, but you know, <laughs> let, him, let him come in. In comes this wild-eyed guy with long hair and a necklace and what, and he came to the, to the foot of the little bamboo cot I was lying on, empties out his bag, gets a couple of gourds, gets some stuff, and then he started chanting, and he's beating on these gourds, and it went on and on and on, and I'm, you know, I'm feeling lousy, I want to sort of doze, and I had, still had the fever, and, and I, I, I don't know how much time went by, but you know, then I came to again, and I started thinking about, well, before I left for Laos, you know, I read as many books as I could, and there were very few books about Laos in, in the early 1960s. I then recalled reading one called the, the Tribal Groups of North Laos. Then I recalled a passage, a chapter in the book about the shaman. And, and all of a sudden, a, a paragraph came back. When the shaman is working on the patient, seems not to be getting results. He will leap upon the patient with a knife and stab holes in the abdomen for the evil spirits to get out. <laughs> I, I think, why didn't I think of that? Evil spirits. Yeah. But then, so then I couldn't relax at all. <laughs> I was, and I started thinking, what would I do? You know, would I shoot this guy? Where's my weapon? It's up there, nearer to him than it is to me, leaning against the wall. So then I called the, the, the head of my uh, team in again. I said, Benit, do not leave, bring me a cup of tea, I said, and do not leave this hut again until this guy is gone. <laughs> so again, I don't know exactly how long, but finally he stopped. It, it was a crescendo of hum -hum -hum, really louder and louder and more banging. Then he stopped, and he sort of bowed at me, and he, and he walked out, to my great relief. Still had the evil spirit, still had a fever. Um, and it was by that time, late afternoon, I, I slept. You know, and would you believe in the morning I woke up, the fever had broken. I'm feeling you know, weak, a little bit hungry, but um, you know, it's, it's OK. So I went outside to, uh, to sort of get a, you know, a little air and get some food. Shaman walks by, and you know, he's looking at me, and he's, it's I'm not saying, but I'm just saying the evil spirits are gone. You know who. <laughs> so I, I didn't say anything to him. Pretty soon the Naiban goes by, same thing, you know. It's a good thing I sent the shaman in to see you. And the same night, the, the, the weather broke, and they were able to send a plane in and flew me down to Vientiane. And an American doctor thought it was a touch of dungy fever, but uh, he didn't know anything about the evil spirits. So. But, but it, it's, it was a cultural thing, and I mean, and that's... You, I, I was, I kept, I was irritated, you know, to get sick up there without any recourse. I just had to sort of wait until it was all over. Um, another experience, and it was also uh, unplanned, was the incident in the Congo. Um, when I returned from Laos, I, I went out there for a six-month TDY tour, temporary tour. I liked what I was doing, they liked what I was doing. I th extended three times and spent two years in Laos and enjoyed all of it. I mean, I, as I say, I really felt like I was doing something extremely worthwhile. So, and, and to have that as my first assignment, the, the kind of responsibility I got, um, after, after working in the north for a while, I went down to central Laos and organized uh, what we called road watch teams, and we were we were sending out, I was deploying teams to monitor traffic on what was uh, called the Ho Chi Minh Trail at that time. A lot of this is pretty old, I understand. In fact, uh, just might interject, uh, I, I did work for 13 different directors, and that's mentioned somewhere on the cover of the book. And one of my daughters, I have a platoon of daughters, um, four, and one of them looked at that, 13, she said, Dad, you are O-L-D. <laughs> I got it, you know, I'm, I'm with you on that one. But anyway, after the Congo, or after Laos, I went back. I'm still young, I'm still single. I didn't do much dating up in those villages. Um, and I, I speak 
even better French. I mean, I always found a French speaker in each village to use as my translator. And so, how about going to Stanleyville in the Congo? Right? Sure. I mean, put me in, coach. I was perfectly happy to go. And um, went over to the Congo, arrived just after Christmas in, in 1964. And uh, my job was to contact and reconstruct our net of agents in the Northeast Congo. The Northeast Congo is the size of France. I mean, it's an enormous country. Um, and so there was a lot of territory and a lot of movement. Uh, it was just at the end of what they called the Simba Revolution. The Simbas were a group of uh, insurgents, another tribal group fighting with one that was in, in power. And, and I had to try to get these people, and it was tough because they all had run out and hid in the jungle so they wouldn't get run over by the, by the Simbas. And on a, on a given day, we took off, bright sunny day, and I was planning to do a reconnaissance of the Sudanese border with the Congo because we felt that weapons and materials were coming in from the Sudan, supplied by the Chinese and the Russians for this particular group, which was a leftist group. It, it was a story of the, of the Cold War. Um, if they were supporting them, we didn't like them, and if we were supporting them, they didn't like them, and it, it went on. But um, we ran into a, a thunderstorm, tossed all over the sky, got lost, and ultimately had to crash land. Pilot was a Cuban, another long story, but it's in the book. <laughs> and um, I said, but Juan, we both got parachutes. Uh, let's jump. He says, no, 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 no. Um, and it was the first time I, I came to realize that most pilots will not jump out of that airplane unless the wings fall off or it's on fire. I mean, we can crash land. I said, OK, you crash land, I'll jump. <laughs> it wouldn't work. I mean, you. You've got to have the right altitude and attitude and whatnot. So we did, in fact, crash. And uh, we, we bounced in, and there were sparks. And I got a, a, a splash of ignited fuel oil, uh, aviation fuel, across my uh, left front. It missed Juan. He was not hurt at all. He jumped out, ran away, and kept saying, get out of the plane, get out of the plane. I said, I am trying to get out of the plane. Um, I, I couldn't get my eyes open. They were singed. Uh, my hands were badly, they were, I couldn't use them. And I finally got the seatbelt off with my elbow, and then I'm trying to climb out of this plane with a parachute hanging on my back. Um, he ran back and sort of helped me, and, and we got away from the plane uh, before it blew up. But we then spent the night hiding. We got as far away as we could because we didn't know if the Simbas might find it um, and, then, and then get after us. So after a couple of days with him making little forays, we ran into a tribal group. Happily, they were pro-Western, uh, pro-government of, uh, of Kinshasa, they call it now. And so they helped us. By helping us, they hid me outside their village, and they helped Juan drive, and walk, uh, drive a bicycle and walk for 10 days before they could get to a safe area. And then a Belgian helicopter crew came back to get me. Um, while hovering over me that first day, uh, the, the helicopter had engine failure, had to crash land. Uh, the next day, they came back at another helicopter and got all of us and got out of there. Um, I was quite lucky, um, frankly, the, as, as, as uh, noted. The, um, the natives did. Um, stand me up about the second or third day and, and took their knives and cleaned out all the bugs that had gotten into my burns, my open burns, thereby um, ruining the uh, tendons in my fingers, thereby ruining what was a pretty decent jump shot at one time. But I, that, was, that was a loss that I had as a result of this. But, uh, but it did save my life, I, that's for sure. They smeared this stuff on there. And in fact, it kept infections out of my body and fluids in my body. And that's how you die from, uh, from bad burns. It was, uh, when they said their doctor was going to help me, I was almost into a coma by that time. But I said, never mind. I mean, thinking, what do these guys know about how to treat a burn? You know, I'll wait for my own doctor. But fortunately, they, they took matters into their own hands. 
when I was being transferred from, uh, from the helicopter to a, a waiting C-130 to take me down to the Capitol and then henceforth to the Burn Center in Texas, um, they were carrying me on a stretcher and a Belgian priest was there. He took one look and thought that this stuff smeared on my burns was actually gangrene, that I, it was black and bluish and whatnot. No hope for this guy. So he did what a, you know, a, a dutiful Catholic priest will do, and he gave me the last rites. Um, and not unbeknownst to me, he put a crucifix around my neck. Um, again, I mean, uh, I didn't have any evil spirits, but I mean, the, the, these things, uh, who am I to say that it doesn't work? Uh, so I, I finally got to the burn center, and when I was being moved from intensive care, the nurse asked me, what shall I do with your um, crucifix? And I said, I don't know. I'm a Lutheran. I don't, have a, I don't wear a crucifix. Uh, and I was thinking, you know. And they said, look, that's all you had on, here, on when you got here. And it was a, f- a few weeks later when a friend who had been there came to visit me and explained this whole thing that I, I found out the story about the, the crucifix. So Laos and the Congo were what we would call covert operations. Um, we're working in between diplomacy on the one hand and sending the Marines on the other hand. Something quiet, something discreet. Um, hopefully it would be plausibly deniable and that's, that's a, there's a wide range uh, in that thing. But um, we were working at that time in Congo to help the pro-Western Congolese government resist attacks by a communist-supported rebel group. In Laos, we were working to support a pro-Western government in Vietnam to resist North Vietnamese attempts to use Laos, uh, covert covert operations. I I note as well for you that um, we, the CIA, the clandestine service, we don't sit around making these things up. Um, These are things that come from the National Security Council and they are directed by the president. When I went to Laos, I was directed by President Kennedy. That was his, it was his approval. Um, we're going over there to do a specific job. Um, it is approved by the National Security Council, as I said. The president signs a presidential finding. Um, you'll, you'll find over the years that when these things go well, nothing ever happens. When they don't go well, then the CIA takes the heat. Um, the presidents and the National Security Council sort of back off. and it is, it is not widely known or spread or advertised that they approved it to begin with. Anyway, that's covert operations. Um, an example of a, of a counterintelligence operation. I was the chief of our office in Brussels, Belgium. The country of beer, they call themselves. Um, every, every town has a brewery. I think they, they all have a bunch. But um, I got a picture one day from a, uh, of some colleagues in another station in Europe. Picture is two men. We had already done research. We'd done a lot of homework. One of them is a Belgian Air Force colonel that works at NATO. And he has access to a lot of sensitive information, including a lot of U.S. information having to do with NATO plans and NATO counter, NATO contingency operations, that sort of thing. Uh, The other is a general in the KGB. He's a Russian general. Um, They're both smiling and happy, and we had had discovered that the Belgian, without his service's permission and without reporting it to them, had slipped over to this other city and met with this Russian general. The conclusion was pretty apparent. Um, He is an agent of the KGB and he is reporting to them what to do. So a number of decisions that had to be taken. Ultimately, I decided that I would go to the head of the Belgian military intelligence service, explain it, and put it essentially into their lap. I, in my station, I didn't have the capability to mount the kinds of operations uh, that it would require to, to pin this guy down. This will be very sensitive, Dick, is what the general, the Belgian general said. If you're wrong, if this is not right, uh, we're going to take a lot of heat 
uh, in, a, in a political sense and in a media sense. I said, we're confident of what we've got here. So they did. They mounted an operation. You know, I'm not going to belabor you with all the details, but the, he was under surveillance. Uh, his house was searched one day while he was at work. They found spy gear, as it's called, transmitters and codes and stuff. Um, so we knew it, we had it, but we wanted to catch him red-handed, and we wanted to catch the Russian at the same time. A few more weeks, and finally one of the surveillance notif noticed that um, he'd park his car at the edge of a parking lot, not in the whole park, every day. And in the back seat, lying in the back seat, was a, a, a big red teddy bear, you know, a stuffed animal. Um, and, you know, that would be, the, and then uh, every now and then, that red teddy bear would be up on the shelf in the back seat. And the surveillance was quick enough, you know, and, and alert enough to say, aha, huh, there it is. I mean, that's the signal to the Russian case officer who drives by every day that tonight there's going to be a, a dead drop and tonight I'll collect what he leaves me. Um, it all came to pass. Um, both of them were arrested. The Russian was expelled, and the Belgian colonel um, went to jail, where I, I, I wish he was still there. Well, actually, what happened is that um, several years later, maybe 15, he got a 15-year, he got a 10-year sentence. Ten, 10 years. Is that all? I said, God. I went back because I, again, it's a long story. I got in touch with the, the Belgians who rescued me in the Congo. Even though I had been the chief of station there for three years, it never occurred to me to try to find these guys. But because of the book, um, they found me, as it were, and, and uh, I was in Belgium to, to host a luncheon for these guys and say, thank you very much for the risks that you took um, to save my life. Um, and while there, I had lunch with, uh, with the same Belgian liaison service I had known before. They told me that... Um, this Belgian colonel served the 10 years, got out. The next day was in an auto accident. Um, a dark, a black car hit his car. He was killed. Um, the Belgian guy looked at me and he said, what a coincidence, huh? <laughs> I said, had nothing to do with it. Had nothing to do with it. I didn't even know it until you just told me. But it was, a, it was a coincidence, I have to say. And I didn't lament this guy very much. Um, but that was a, a, an example of a counterintelligence operation. In that case, uh, we didn't, we didn't uh, deal with the, the FBI because the guy wasn't here. He was overseas. Um, I did deal with the uh, Secretary General of, of NATO at the time and briefed him. And he said, he said take care of it, and I don't want to read about it in the papers. And I said, I got it. Yeah, we'll, we'll do it. But it all worked out. Um, I mentioned Hong Kong, and I, we had two different tours in Hong Kong, which is a little bit unusual. But um, we, we had a total of seven um, years in Hong Kong. Part of it, I speak Mandarin. Uh, I spoke Mandarin. Now I'm good in a restaurant, but that's about all. Um, I spoke Thai, same thing. I spoke Spanish, same thing. My French is still pretty good, and I can, I can still carry on conversations. In fact, I watch the news in French three or four times a week at home just to keep my ear tuned in, because I might go back and visit Paris at some point. But Hong Kong is a fascinating city, um, teeming with people. Uh, I remember the first time I was going to go out to meet an agent, and of course, we want to conduct counter surveillance. We don't want to be followed to a meeting because that's going to identify the agent. So I get out on the street, I'm in what they call central area, look around, wall to wall people, and they all look the same. They're all, you know, five foot five with black hair and dark clothes, and I mean it was how to pick out a surveillance it was incredible. So our, our defense was um, take hours in route ride ferries, ride taxis, ride streetcars, ride, uh, and hoping, and of course the, the ultimate goal is to see somebody twice. And 
in, in the course of all that, if you see somebody twice, we don't believe in coincidences, and that would be enough to, uh, to abandon that particular meeting. Uh, but it was an extremely difficult environment um, to operate in because the Chinese obviously had control over whatever they wanted to have control. I mean, the Brits, it was still a British colony controlled by the British special branch and, and police, but, but the Chinese were there in great numbers. So it inhibited our, our efforts to, um, to try to get out to our meetings, meet with our agents, even in, to recruit agents. Uh, it had to be done, as I say, you know, very carefully. Um, I'll, I'll digress for just a minute and talk about my family. I said I have uh, four daughters. To me, um, and I think, I think they all would agree, um, living in foreign cultures, speaking a foreign language, um, I, I, they come back with a dimension that a lot of their peers don't have because you know, that's an experience that it's hard to, uh, to balance. I mean, they were, they were always in what we call an, uh, an international school which taught in English and had a lot of American students in it, but it also had a lot of local students in it. So it was a... Oh, you could tell it. My voice is dying, huh? Thank you. Excuse me, one second. I think it's dry. At that time, um, that we had the... F well, no, actually. The first time we only had... Well, we went to Hong Kong, we had a daughter. We stayed there four years, we left with three daughters. <laughs> and, and a fourth one had just been born. So I, I used to, we, we went often to a, a particular Chinese restaurant. Um, and we, we arrived with a daughter. And then we had two. And then we had three. And, then, and the waiters, in the, were, they said, oh, it's too bad. Oh, Mr. Home. God, <laughs> what? that's really, you know, I'm thinking, Daughter's fine, my wife's fine. I mean, get out of here, guy. But they just couldn't believe that. Uh, and of course, my wife kept losing stature each, each time. <laughs> but there was another girl born. You know. At the end, they, they said, well, now you've got all four legs of the table. Next one will certainly be the top. And I said, fine, you guys. But the experiences of my girls, um, we were a family that enjoyed tennis a lot. We, we were a member of a, of a local tennis club. And the girls all got a grounding, they all played a lot. Um, my oldest daughter was on the Hong Kong Junior Davis Cup team, um, partly because she is a pretty good tennis player, but partly because the Chinese wouldn't give their daughters a tennis racket or, or lessons or anything like that. I mean, there were very few Chinese who actually you know, played tennis, uh, I mean, girls in any case. So she got from that um, a sense of accomplishment and and confidence worked out. Another girl was in, um, I'm trying to remember now, I, occasionally I have retrieval problems. I can't remember what the British call a, um, a debate, or, I mean, not sorry, um, a public speaking. Yeah. Anyway, Allie um, was going to the, the German British school at that time learning German and learning British and having a, a British teacher who criticized her, her accent all the time. You, know, you don't know how to say forest. And Ellie would say forest. No, forest. You know, they'd go back and forth. But in the end, Allison competed in this thing and she won her, her section on Hong Kong Island and then went to the colony finals and, and went, uh, went on to uh, place second in the whole colony for this speaking, public speaking competition. It's, it's, a, it's very, we wouldn't use the word and I can't remember what it was. But, but again, Allison came out of it, um, you know, able to stand up in front of a group and speak and, and uh, uh, gain some confidence. She is an attorney today. I think, I don't know whether that uh, played a role or not, but she did well. We had, we had um, again, because of the situation, we were able to save some money, and we actually purchased um, an apartment in a chalet in Switzerland. 
improbable, but it happened, and we had it for about 20 years. And, and back and forth to tours, and while we were in Washington, we would go there periodically. And so, you know, we, we did a lot of skiing um, on the mountains um, in, in the French-speaking area of, of Switzerland. And it was, it was a, again, a, gave them something, a dimension that, that they wouldn't have had otherwise, and, and they gained from it. Bottom line is I'm, a, I'm an advocate of giving your kids that, that kind of exposure. On, on one of my uh, headquarters tours, and they, frankly, they got more interesting as I got higher ranked. You know, when you're a junior officer and you go back to headquarters, you're basically doing grunt work, um, name traces and file checks and, you know, the, all the stuff that the field needs to have you do in order to support the activities in the field. And in the field is where the action is, and when you're a young officer, a junior officer, that's where you want to be. As I got more senior, then they got better. And when I went back from the second tour in Hong Kong, um, I was named to be the head of the terrorism effort for the U.S. government at the CIA. Um, when I first walked in the office, the, the sign on the, on the doorway said, terrorist group. I said, nothing doing. You know, I'm not going to go home and tell my wife I head up the CIA's terrorist group. We are against it. It shall be known as the counterterrorism group. So that's, that's how we became. And, and it was, it's, it's, it's explicable. At, at the time, we were, there was hardly any directed terrorism at the U.S. This was the early 80s. The Palestinians were harassing the Israelis, and, and they were harassing each other. And there was, the terrorism was far away in, in most Americans' eyes. Occasionally a plane would be hijacked or something like that. But in that, in, in late 81, early 82, we had an a army general kidnapped by a terrorist group in Italy. We had a military attaché assassinated by a terrorist group in Paris. We had a terrorist threat against President Reagan, that Gaddafi was going to send a team over to get after him. Um, Anwar Sadat was assassinated in Egypt uh, after we had trained his security force. Um, a number of things happened that really heightened it. And so, in its wisdom, the U.S. government says, okay, we got to have counter-terrorist groups everywhere. So, a number of agencies formed, uh, and, and our terrorist group became the counterterrorism group. And by virtue of being a, the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, I became the head of organizing this effort, um, interagency activity, um, forming committees and, and traveling and just a whole range of different kinds of uh, efforts. And it, it, um, we went from about 30 people to 150 and and ultimately constructed what is today the, the National Counterterrorism Center. Um, and it's, this decade has seen, uh, you know, as all of you are well aware, a lot of activity directed against terrorism. Um, and it started at that particular moment. Um, we were after Carlos at that time. Uh, we were after Carlos from the, an, an early date when he was involved in some in the OPEC takeover and things like that, um, we was just we were monitoring him at that time. Uh, later, when I was in Paris, um, we were able to actually identify his location and his situation. Again, um, excellent work by some of our officers in the Sudan, and then and ultimately the, the French were able to um, capture him and bring him back. Um, the story is almost amusing in some ways. Um, Carlos had a, uh, a wife, and for reasons that we, of course, didn't know, he got himself a vasectomy. And, and I guess by that time he was divorced and sort of out on his own. Then he met this young Jordanian girl and got married again and decided he wanted to have children. So. He, in, in cartoon, 
hospital cartoon, he went into the hospital to get a reversal of this operation. Um, I mean, he talk about a risky effort. I mean, I, I <laughs> but um, the way it was all organized is that when he um, when he finished with the operation, he's uh, still under anesthesia, and he's strapped on a gurney, and they, 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 they wheel the gurney out. The French just grabbed it, put it in a car, took him to the airport, and he, he's now in, a, in the slammer in Paris, and he's serving a life tour, and it, he deserves it. I mean, what, a, what a, a dummy. Apparently, on the plane, he was, of course, scared to death because he initially thought it was the Israelis who had him. Um, but, but after, um, you know, and the, and the French were all completely silent. They said nothing. You know, the whole time, they, the flight. They got to uh, Paris, and then they, the, the intercom came on, and the guy in the intercom, of course, is speaking French. So you know, he was almost, they said, visibly relieved that, that he, he wasn't going to uh, Israel, he was going to France. So it goes on. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm using up all the time or not. Um, oh, yeah, I are. Let me just um, stop, and I'd be, I'd be happy to, to try to address questions and clarify anything. At the end, um, I will just quote Mark Twain, who said at one point, allegedly, um, a speech is like a love affair. Any dumb fool can start one, but it takes some savoir-faire and some finesse to end one. Um, <laughs> lacking those skills, I will just tell you that I'm finished. <laughs> and I'm, and I'll, I'll take any questions that you have. So. What we're going to do this afternoon, because there's so many people in here, we're going to ask that you please kind of queue up your questions and um, come stand in kind of one of the pockets on either side. I will take questions, and then hopefully my partner in crime returns shortly. So if you could, if you have a question, isn't that going to be sort of make your way to the pocket? Complex. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but I think it might be easier than me trying to get to you. So, questions. You had, uh, hello. you had stated uh, that the terrorism did not really start until about 1980. Terrorism um, basically directed at the U.S. Correct. Yeah. But terrorism directed out from the U.S., when had that started? Uh, what kind of terrorism is that? Operation Cyclone, July 3rd, 1979. The CIA went into Afghanistan to entice Russia into a war, and on Christmas Eve, December 24th, it worked. That was July 3rd of 1979. The Shah was expelled from Iran on January 16th, 1979, and we needed to create a, a common war going on in the Middle East because the Shah of Iran had been expelled. And the CIA did that. Jimmy Carter put over $4 billion he never went to one House of Congress nor the Senate, and that money was appropriated to start the war in Afghanistan, July 4th, 1979. <laughs> and it was your group that did it. I am, I'm fascinated You've by the- you never heard of Operation Cyclone? Uh, no. Or I mean, you've asked your question. I'm, um, I'm fascinated by the question. Um, I, I will note that we practice compartmentation and need to know and um, obviously, I was not in the need to know group uh, on that particular. Look it up on the internet, and you will find the whole story on The internet has a this host of things story. that are and are true and are not true. I mean, I, uh, that's not the. Uh, I can. I can. Uh, that's. I'm interested in, in the question because uh, Jimmy Carter directed the United States to entice the Russians to invade Afghanistan. Do I have that right? A French word that comes to mind is bizarre. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I, thank you for the question. I will look it up, but uh, that's, that's an interesting start. Thank you. My question is a bit less controversial. Than that. <laughs> I, I didn't hear that. Sorry? Go ahead. I was wondering, there's a, I'm a political science major at KU, and I'm really interested in like threat analysis. I'm wondering, there's a lot of, there's not like a sole thread, I guess, that people are in agreement on over like what the biggest threat is to the United States. 
been spotted people think it's China. A lot of people think it's still homegrown terrorism. A lot of people think it might be Mexico. I was wondering, is there like a threat that you think is most threatening to the United States right now? Now? Yeah. Sure. I, th I think um, what, what you're looking at in today's world, what, what they'll tell us a lot is, is a cyber war, is the next, um, next thing coming at us that could be um, very dangerous and, and it is extremely difficult to try to prepare for it. Um, I think there's a law percolating now in Congress addressing uh, cyber war and, and what we need to do about it. The plan is that we put the private uh, sector and the government in, in cooperation um, to protect grids and protect uh, databases and protect, uh, so it, I mean, it's something that is in process and underway and, and soon I think you're gonna see the first law come out. And it, it's controversial. I mean, there are issues about privacy and there are issues about um, what, what a, a company will and will not sign on to and what they would give up or not give up in terms of their own um, holdings. So it's, it's an issue that's coming out. But I, I just heard yesterday, as a matter of fact, on the news that the war on terrorism is over. Um, I was really surprised to hear that. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, 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 didn't, I, I was too late to get any, any substance about the report, but I, I will, I'm gonna look that up on the internet as well and, <laughs> and see because I, it seems to me that places like Yemen and Somalia and uh, various areas, it's not over and it, it's not over by a long shot. So we'll, we'll just have to wait and see on, on that. Sorry. Thank you. Hi, I'd like to thank you for your service, first of all. Yeah, I appreciate awesome. it. Like I said, apart from that airplane crash, I loved it <laughs> the whole time. Yeah, the, I've noticed that there's been a broad sort of convergence between uh, military and intelligence, especially last Monday when uh, Defense Clandestine Service was announced. So I just wondered your thoughts about the uh, general trend. About, I'm sorry, I was... The general convergence between uh, the military ah, and the intelligence sure. organization. Sure, you bring up, um, I mean, that's a a current issue of a lot of concern. The convergence, the, the close cooperation between the military and the CIA at this point. Um, many of us have concerns about that. If, if you all recall, um, I mean, 9-11 was an unprecedented attack on us. And it then a lot of wise people, I think, sat around and tried to think of ways to deal with a very unprecedented situation. Some of them were controversial, um, and, and they've developed over this, the past decade. One of the things that came out of it was the, uh, the unmanned aerial vehicle, the Predator. Um, early on, um, that was used to surveil and, and find out locations of various groups. Um, then, I think it was the Director of Science and Technology figured out, well, we could put a Hellfire missile on that guy, and, uh, and when we have a a really bad one-sided, we can take him out. Um, that started in, I, you know, three, 2003, 2004, something like that. And, that. and that, during the Bush era, the, up till 2008, there were sporadic attacks like that. But it, what it did is it started bringing the CIA and many of our officers um, into a sort of a lethal mode which is quite unlike um, our particular, uh, that's, not, that's not our bag, we, we collect intelligence. But in our support to the military, we were drawn closer and closer into that particular activity. Um, the current administration, in its, for reasons that, that are theirs, um, decided that we're gonna up the ante a lot. So the number of those strikes has increased many times over in the last couple of years. Um, and we are, I mean, think of the last time you read in the paper where we captured a senior Al-Qaeda leader or Taliban leader. And the answer is, you can't think of it. Um, we're, we're not capturing anymore, we're killing. Um, we, officers like me, people like me, and I'm retired, I'm, um, we, we're concerned about that, A, because uh, if you capture them and they're leaders, they're the source of potentially a lot of in intelligence. I mean, they can be of great use to us. 
um, dead. Um, it's just one more guy, one more notch on the... On the so that plus... Um, and I'll, I'll go one step further here in terms of um, resources and budget. Um, Washington has decided that they're going to cut I want 500 billion from the defense budget in terms of a sequestration um, this year. Now, we have waited to see agreement on that for a long time, and I, I have no idea whether or not. But if that comes about, our budget is combined in there, our, I mean, the intelligence community. So there will be a budget cut to intelligence uh, at this time. It seems to me that as you're pulling out of Iraq, pulling out of Afghanistan, facing places like Yemen and Somalia, you need more intelligence, not less intelligence. You need us to resume our mission of global strategic intelligence collection. There are a finite number of resources available at the agency, at the CIA. To the extent that you use them in support of the military, in support of lethal operations, they're not going to be available for use in the regular mission of the, of the clandestine service, which is collection of intelligence on a global scale against places that still concern uh, us, Russia, China, India, Africa, Latin America. These are places we have to, to focus on you know, to try to get some. So um, that's, that is a, a dilemma currently underway in Washington. I, I was one of an, a, 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 a four of our, we went up to Congress in 1990 to give them a briefing on you know, what's the plan after the Cold War is over, which ended in 89? Okay, what's going to happen now? We went up there and said, look, um, this, the world is still a dangerous place. You know, we plan to do A, B, C, D, D. You know. They listened. Um, they ignored us. They cut the budget um, by over 25% all throughout the 90s. So our, our personnel strength and our capabilities for language training and covert operation, all those kinds of things, dwindled all during the, the 90s. Um, it was, and it was a cookie cutter kind of cut. Um, that is to say that the library at CIA got cut the same amount as the clandestine service got cut. Where's the logic in that? I mean, it was a, uh, now, mind you, I'm, I'm a little bit biased in terms of this stuff, but, but still, um, as I say, we need more intelligence, not less. The current director of national intelligence, uh, General Clapper has said, no worries, mate. We're, uh, we're going to do it smarter this time. I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have a lot of confidence in Congress being able to come to agreement, notwithstanding the fact that there is general strong support in Congress for the intelligence community and the agency. But uh, these are issues that, um, that are ongoing, and I'm... I, not sure where it'll go. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, when Admiral Stansfield Turner was director of CIA, I believe there was uh, more emphasis placed on electronic surveillance and that means of gathering information rather than human. Uh, sources. How did that affect the work of the CIA? Good question. You just fastened on my least favorite director. Um, uh, it, um, we, of course, were dismayed um, when, he, he, when he walked in the door and said, okay, um, we're going to focus on technical collection and technical operations and technical this and technical that. Um, and for reasons I've, I've tried to explain, uh, it is our view that human intelligence is very important, that it provides a dimension in our reporting that's, that's not available via, via technical. So it was a period, and at the same, at the same time, um, Jimmy Carter, of course, his roommate at Annapolis, um, was the president. And Jimmy Carter, nice guy, I mean, I no qualms about it, but he had a sort of a, 
I want to say, naive view of the world. Um, at one point, Jimmy Carter is, is alleged to have said, well, the Russians lied to me. <laughs> no kidding, Jimmy. <laughs> Did he, it was a, I mean, again, we were dismayed. So that period um, was a tough one for us. Um, it was exacerbated by the fact that um, it was just after Watergate. Um, the, the, we, had, we had been allegedly involved, but Dick Helms, our director at the time, uh, refused to cooperate with that, with that lie. And uh, nonetheless, part of it fell off on us. Um, so the period from Watergate until, until President Reagan took power uh, was a difficult one for the agency. Um, we did not, we, we did not, I mean, he, Turner actually also said, call me admiral, don't call me director. What? I mean, we're saying, wait a minute, this is not the Navy. This is a, so for a number of reasons, um, uh, there may have been one below him in my ranking, but I, c I can't remember who it might have been. <laughs> not a guy I like. Oh, for sure. Dick Helms was one of us. I mean, he, uh, he came out of uh, the clandestine service. And as a matter of fact, when, um, when I was missing in the Congo, Dick Helms was a director of the clandestine service. Word came back that, you know, that, well, they found him, really, how are things? So Dick Helms went up to the director at the time, John McCone, and said, we found our guy, we need a plane to go get him and bring him back. Um, McCone said, okay, I'll call McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense. Um, he did. McNamara said, is he still alive? <laughs> he said, yep, he's still alive. Okay, send it. So a plane was sent, and I thank all of you taxpayers for this expense. <laughs> it was sent from McGuire in New Jersey to the Congo and then to um, the Burn Center in Texas. Um, they, it was specifically to get me. There was a doctor and some peers, but it was Dick Helms who sort of engineered. Not only that, after I was in the hospital for a long time, it, it was hard to make me as good looking as I am today, you know, so it took <laughs> two years. Uh, but um, while I was there, Dick Helms came to visit me at Walter Reed. I'm a, I'm a GS nothing. I was a very junior guy. I was very early in my career. I'm hurt, but the director, and, and it speaks volumes about the kind of a man he was. He came out there to visit me at Walter Reed. It ruined my cover. <laughs> Nobody believed that the director of CIA would come to visit this, this State Department guy. So, but I mean, I was willing to, to sacrifice that. Dick Helms, one of my favorites, for sure. You know, I, I did not mention, and I, I just briefly will say that in the epilogue to this book, I direct a lot of thoughts to the 9-11 Commission and, and the intelligence community after 9-11. Uh, I, I read the 9-11 Commission report, which I recommend. That the, the narrative of it is, is interesting. It's not bureaucraties. It's real English. Um, you can understand it. It thoroughly covers all the whole situation just prior to 9-11. The conclusions are, to me, were skewed and the recommendations were further skewed. Um, I didn't agree with a, a number of them. And I would just briefly mention that they created the, the, national, the Director of National Intelligence, which I advocate abolishing tomorrow. Um, this probably won't happen because uh, it is difficult for them to acknowledge. But what it is, is another layer of bureaucracy in Washington. It's not, it doesn't add anything and in many ways, it detracts. Uh, it was supposed to be a staff of 50. I think it's nearing 2,000, which is typical in Washington. Um, and and they're, they're, not, they're not doing anything that's adding value. They are taking officers out of the line and, and go down and sit uh, in a staff position. So I would also uh, abolish the, the Homeland Security, uh, a group I think and you could check it on the internet if you want. It's, it's about 180,000 people. 21 or 22 agencies were combined. 
again, it is so bureaucratic, so tangled in Washington level stuff that um, each of the participants is probably less, I would say, is less effective than it would be on its own. Uh, it, again, it comes out of a commission and a Congress that felt compelled to react and, in my own view, overreacted in, in a number of areas. Um, there was even talk of abolishing, not, not abolishing, but in, in addition to the FBI, uh, they wanted to create another agency akin to the MI5 internal security agency in, in England. So we would add one more agency to the thing, which we do not need. And I, I was one advocating, look, the FBI simply has to get on the ball. Um, the FBI heretofore, you know, they would react to situations. Somebody robbed the bank. Okay, we'll go and we'll get that guy, we'll find him and we'll arrest him and we'll put him in the slammer. Now we're asking them, get him before he robs the bank, so to speak. Find these terrorists before they can conduct any operations and, and thereby save the country you know, from another attack. We've, we're 10 years into this now and I think there's evidence to say that the FBI has done a darn good job. I mean, they have modified their thinking and it's not easy, it's a cultural change for them to have to make. To, to start working more or less like we do overseas. Recruit people to tell them what's going on in various places so that they can preempt these attacks on us. Um, you, you read now and then about one that they've, they captured a guy who was gonna do this or who was gonna do that. And, and they, they get onto it and they, and they get him down. So I, um, happily we still have a, an FBI and we don't have um, an MI5. Finally, I would mention just the Patriot Act, which was passed shortly after 9-11. I think in October, um, they passed this, 97 to three, or I mean, it was just overwhelmingly passed. After it was passed, then politics came in and they started harping at each other about why do you do this, why do you do that? This is too intrusive, or this, is, this violates privacy, or this, just a whole host of these. Happily, about a year ago now, it was passed and renewed again. Um, same statutes, same situation. And what it does is it gives intelligence and security agencies powers that, that we can use effectively to help protect the country. Now, yes, there is a trade-off in terms of privacy or in terms of intercept if efforts, but I mean, the trade-off to me um, they, they're, they're carefully done, and it just increases our, our security. If there's a guy in, let me say Wichita, just to, <laughs> who is talking periodically with a mullah in Pakistan, I don't mind if the NSA is listening to those conversations. I mean, why is that happening? And then they key on words, um, bombs or operations or and, and, and then to do that, they have to have a court's permission. They have to explain to the court why they have a suspicion and why they want to be able to do it. Now, if they listen to it for a while and it's nothing, they stop listening. They don't want to, they're not, they got enough to do. Uh, and, and, you know, they, it's just a, and the same goes with movements of large amounts of money. Um, and and, it, and it's, it has an impact on terrorist organizations when we're able to preempt and intercept and, 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 and thereby stop you know, their planning. I probably have talked too long, so. Time oh, to one, more one more, okay. Um, this, uh, the Ford Motor Company, they wait, have- Wait, wait, you gotta speak louder. At the Ford Motor Company at the world headquarters in Dearborn, Michigan, they have a room where the president can talk to each of the presidents of each company that's in all of the different countries of the world. And to better connect all these different organizations of the government, I was wondering if they have one room with lots of different monitors where they can talk to all of these different uh, heads of the different departments at one time, like the Ford Motor Company does. Yeah, I mean, that, that kind of technology is, is available in the government 
as well. Sometimes the government's a little behind the curve, but um, at the White House, uh, at the Pentagon, at the CIA, in the National Counterterrorism Center, you know, the, the ability to communicate individually or collectively with whole bunches of people is, is there. We have that capability. Now, I, I would add that um, what we would talk about with the president of country A, we wouldn't talk about with the president of country B. I mean, there are a lot of global issues that, that present you know, conflicts with our national interests. So how it's set up um, would be a, a function of our assessment of those particular issues that we're gonna talk about with any given country. So, uh, well, thank you very much for your... Honor.